Okay. Okay. I think I can start. Um, so thanks everyone for joining here. Um, this is some really fun work that I did uh, in during my fellowship in Germany. Some of you guys might have seen a previous presentation I did on the horse hunting crocodiles. This is uh, another really remarkable fossil from the same site. Um, so we'll be hearing about a, a different project, but but set in the same kind of time and place there. So I'll be communicating with Chantal to move slides. Here we go. Um, so before we dive into the, the fossil record, though, a little very brief setup on um, what the, the modern record is. Um, so what we've got here are uh, what's called living archosaurs. So archosaurs are, are um, birds and crocodiles. They're fairly close relatives. <clears throat> and then um, also included in this group are the dinosaurs, as we're used to thinking of them. Um, so T-Rex is an archosaur. <clears throat> excuse me, Stegosaurus is an archosaur, all of the dinosaurs, as well as the flying reptiles, the pterosaurs. Um, so uh, now both of those actually exhibit parental care, meaning that they do some sort of level of caring for their young, um, particularly when they're still in the egg. Um, so parsimony is something that basically just means the... Um, Kind of simplest solution is the most likely one, more or less. And that is sort of the guiding principle as we think about evolution. So the assumption then would be that um, parental care would actually be something that would be shared um, in not only crocodiles and birds, but everything that came between them, namely the dinosaurs. Now, there's been a couple of very, very rare cases where fossil dinosaurs are actually preserved with some of that behavioral trait, with the eggs in direct association. So in the middle there, we've got a um, kind of dinosaur known as the oviraptors. Uh, this is a technically not oviraptor, but don't worry about it. Um, but it's preserved with eggs. And this uh, thought to have actually been brooding those eggs. This is like direct evidence of parental care, um, or at least exceedingly likely case of parental care. Um, but the idea of these things having one shared sort of evolution of parental care is kind of thrown a bit into question um, because when we look at the fossil record for pterosaurs, that's again the flying reptiles, so things like quote unquote pterodactyls and pteranodons and Kitzelquatlus, all that stuff, um, there's some evidence with their style of eggs that actually would suggest that they did not exhibit parental care. And because uh, pterosaurs are actually kind of between crocodiles and birds in terms of the evolution of archosaurs, this actually starts to call into question exactly when parental care did come into place, um, because it's possible that it's actually something that evolved independently in those two lines. So if it's evolved independently, then you don't know exactly when in crocodile evolution that came in. Now, there is still another explanation in that pterosaurs might have lost that ability um, but because those become basically equivalent, you don't really have a way of teasing it out. Um, so in order to do that, you kind of need to start, you know, looking for some of these uh, extraordinary um, cases of fossilization in the crocodile fossil record as well. And um, however, that that really requires some some very rare kind of preservation. So you need to not only get um, good enough remains that you can identify the adult, but you have to be able to recognize, you know, either eggs or young. Um, and a lot of the the eggs are, are fairly soft kinds of things. So are the um, so are the young inside. So the babies tend to have even less of a fossil record just because their bones are so tiny and so fragile and not well formed. Um, just a quick pause because it's not showing up on my screen. Um, are you guys seeing a picture of like an alligator on a nest? Or are you seeing a picture of an evolutionary tree? And I guess I should be on the other conversation here. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Sorry, it's it's being a little slow. Okay, uh, okay, this is this is fine. So I think we got the fossil eggs up right now, right? Um, cool, that's fine. Um, so when we look at the 
a uh, fossil record of crocodile eggs. There actually are quite a few. They they range from kind of the middle of the age of the dinosaurs ish to um, actually well after the mass extinction, um, and lots of sites in between from around the world. Really, they seem to have a similar shape and style and and pattern that you would see in modern crocodile eggs. Um, however, there weren't any of these cases of like direct association with the parent like we see in the dinosaurs. Now this is again exceedingly rare. So just because you know they, they hadn't been found for a really long time doesn't mean that um, you know it wasn't there. This is just a very, very unusual circumstance that needs very, very special uh, kind of geological situation in order to preserve. Um, now there actually is a, a record, uh, a historical record. The oldest one that I'm aware of by far is a petroglyph uh, that was found in Libya, dating back to about 9,000 years old, um, where uh, humans had actually carved into the side of the rock a mother crocodile with a baby, um, showing that this uh, this you know characteristic has been observed by people for quite a very very long time, um, which is pretty extraordinary in its own right. Um, but we want to get into the fossil record. We want to get into the old old stuff. <clears throat> so, it requires this really, really rare kind of preservation. Let's move on. Um, now, luckily, there are a few places where fossilization is just exceptional, just beyond what we normally get in most places in the world. Um, and a lot of this has been gathered up at the Geiseltal collection in Halle, Germany, um, which is uh, part of Martin Luther Universität or University, um, which is where I was fortunate enough to work for two years on a fellowship. Um, the preservation there is just, just incredible. Um, so what you're seeing in the bottom right is a fossil beetle um, that actually has um, kind of preservation of some of the, the cells that kind of cause iridescence. Um, as well as really just everything across the ecosystem from plants to um, all the little animals, frogs, uh, salamanders, fish, um, the big crocodiles, uh, these taper-like things, um, all of which were in a setting of um, more or less a, a set of subtropical islands. So picture kind of a, a something kind of like the Mediterranean today, but with really, really lush vegetation. So just you know, really diverse, very wet, warm environment, absolutely great for all kinds of things to thrive. And the spot we're specifically talking about is that red dot, um, which is not, looks kind of close to the coast, but the coast still would have been like, you know, 12, 15 miles away, something like that. Like not that far away, but not close enough that you would call it like a coastal environment. It's still very much a, a jungle kind of environment. Um, and you just get everything and it's just incredible. And that is where you can get something like this. Now, this is actually a fossil that was collected in the 1930s. It's absolutely incredible. And when I was uh, I got there, you know, being the, the crocodile lover that I am, I immediately started going through all the, the crocodile material. And when I saw this, I was just absolutely floored. I had never never in my life seen anything like this or even heard of something like this even existing anywhere. Um, I, I've been to many museums all over the place. I've seen many, many fossil crocodiles, some of which have been really, really well preserved, but this absolutely floored me as absolutely exceptional and extraordinary in every way. Um, so what we're looking at here, and we'll go to the next one that's got a bit of a line drawing that I did. Um, is a sketch of that same thing here, but highlighted in yellow are fossilized eggs that were preserved in place immediately adjacent to an adult crocodilian. Now this is Diplocynodon. This is a, um, it's closer to alligators really. So it's in an extinct line. Um, it's actually kind of a bit, a bit more close to alligators and caimans than it is to crocodiles. We typically use the word crocodilian, especially when we spell it with an I for technical reasons, um, that this is actually something that was, um, we, we can generally just kind of refer to these as uh, crocodiles, although if you want to get technical, it's it's a lot closer to an alligator, but I'll 
just for simplicity's sake, we'll we'll call it a crock for now. Um, and when you look at the the eggs that were preserved with the mother, they match up really well with other uh, fossil crocodilian eggs that were found at the same site. So even though they weren't found in direct association with an adult like this one, um, the shell and everything about it, the size, texture, everything actually matched up really well with um, something that's referred to as an OO species. We actually have different scientific names for fossilized eggs, um, but this matched up very, very well with fossil crocodile eggs that had been recognized from that site. Oh, dear. Um, now, in order to start kind of giving a little bit more confidence to these eggs belonging to, or, you know, this being a, a mother egg scenario, there's actually really good data for existing relatives, that would be the alligators and the caimans, for the size of an egg that a mother would be expected to lay. So we can actually look at that based on measurements of the eggs of the fossil. Now, those eggs are crushed a bit, um, so it does very slightly change um, the, the overall length, but you're still getting very, very close. So within that, we got a little bit of a range, um, not very much, of the fossil eggs. So if you take that, you take uh, measurements of the mother, um, you can sort of predict what you would expect um, for uh, the size of the egg for the size of the mother. And this is uh, usually in crocodilians and most reptiles, really, we talk in terms of what's called the snout vent length, or SVL. Um, this is basically an approximation of size um, to, to give you what that really means from the tip of the snout to the cloaca, uh, which is where all the business happens. Uh, it's basically the butt. Um, the reason why that's used is because uh, tail length, uh, because a lot of reptiles end up um, losing bits of their tail. This is actually very common through uh, usually interspecies aggression uh, and intra, um, where uh, for one reason or another, they lose little bits of tail. Um, so we end up actually using this SVL instead of total body length instead, which seems a bit odd. But anyway, proxy for size, right? Um, and the eggs really match up with the kind of size that you would expect based on the eggs. You can also work that back the other way from the egg to the mother. Uh, again, you get, um, or sorry, from the mother to the eggs to the size of the mother, what kind of eggs, size eggs would you expect? Again, you get something that falls within the range of what we're seeing in the fossil there. Um, so in terms of size relationship between the two, um, they're all pretty darn consistent. Um, so there's no surprises there. Now, this fossil came from uh, a really widely exposed part of what was an open pit coal mine um, that was excavated out for a long, long time. Um, obviously, this happened in the 1930s, but it continued up into the 1990s. Um, it actually, after that, it was retired and actually flooded, so you can no longer actually find any fossils at the site, which is a little too bad, but they did pull out a lot of good stuff. Um, and this is within one single stratigraphic horizon, so it's all effectively, um, at least geologically speaking, occurred at one point. Now, this was meticulously documented, and thankfully for that, um, into um, what was basically a, a small distributed uh, publication. Um, and in that included a site map, which was really, really good for me, who obviously was not alive in the 1930s to have seen any of this. Um, and they recorded everything, everything. I'm talking every little fish and not just like putting down where a fish was found within these meter grids, but also putting the orientation of each of those. So if it was facing north, south, east, west, that kind of thing. It was really, really extraordinarily detailed. And within that, they did include this nice little sketch of um, the crocodile with the eggs there. So really, really useful stuff. Um, for any of those that might be familiar with German, you might have actually noticed uh, the term Leichenfeld at the top here. Um, it's it's difficult to uh, appropriately translate it into English, but it it's basically corpse field or dying field. It's it field of of bodies more or less, um, which sounds pretty graphic. I get, it kind of is. I get the impression that in in German it's not quite as as graphic in English, but uh, there's really not a better 
translation really um because you've got a bunch of these things all together there um so it's still kind of it's neat um and um there's there's a possibility that these things effectively died in a, a very narrow window of time um in terms of what that environment would have looked like um it would have actually been something pretty similar to this picture here, which is where you actually typically would expect to find something like an alligator making a nest, which we actually got um, with the arrow pointing there. Um, so lots and lots of water, lots and lots of vegetation. That vegetation is key because that's what's actually building up most of the deposit there. Again, this is uh, what's called a brown coal or a lignite deposit, which is effectively just kind of decaying plant matter that built up over a very long, over a, a period of time here. Um, so the fossils are actually coming really within the lignite itself, which is actually pretty rare in terms of geology. Normally these come in layers in between the coal layers, but these are actually within the coal itself. Now, in terms of the kinds of um, creatures that are found there, animals in particular, um, they are almost exclusively aquatic. So we're seeing these things that are spending a lot of time in the water. So things like fish, crayfish, clams are making up um, the majority of what we're finding there with just a few things that you would call sort of amphibious things that spend time on land and water, and then even fewer things that have, um, that are dominantly terrestrial. So things like the horses. Um, so kind of sets the, the environmental stage there a little bit. Um, now in terms of what we actually, in terms of other crocodiles, right? Um, since this is so well mapped out, we can actually measure out how far the nearest crocodile was, and it was 12 meters away. So this is a significant distance. It's not, you know, particularly nearby. So the um, idea that maybe kind of these crocodile eggs were here and coincidentally an adult floated by or something like that is extraordinarily unlikely. Um, so that, you know, there's not like, you know, crocodiles all over the place. You don't necessarily even know which one goes to which. This seems like very good evidence that this is a direct association between the eggs and uh, the adult here. And we're able to, to tease that out because of such good records that they made. Now, in terms of um, looking at how mature the adult is, um, we can actually see there's a, a tool that we use in um, fossil crocodiles based on how modern crocodiles grow, is that the vertebral column, the spinal column, which is made of, of, of vertebrae, um, there's one part called a centrum that fuses onto the neural arch, which is kind of together what uh, brackets the spinal cord itself. Um, and those two pieces fuse as the individual gets older. And that basically starts at the tail and goes to the neck. So what we're seeing is fully fused tail vertebrae and back vertebrae, but the neck vertebrae are actually not fully fused. Now that you might think that that might actually indicate that it's immature, and it does mean that it's not a particularly old individual. But when we compare um, what we got here is a diagram of how those bones fuse from basically hatching to um, kind of old, old age, uh, hatching on the left, old, old age on the right. And what you'll notice is there's a point uh, where sexual maturity is reached long before uh, the bones of the neck actually fuse. In fact, a lot of uh, even old individuals still don't have fused neck vertebrae. Um, so this is showing that, you know, okay, we're, we're still within the, the realm of where we would expect these things to have reached sexual maturity. Obviously, if it's laying eggs, it has to have reached sexual maturity by definition. Um, and what we're also noticing here in orange is where this, the body sizes of this diplocynodon. Now, I should note, diplocynodon does not, to, does not reach the, the large body sizes that alligators can. So this is clearly reaching a um, sexual maturity at uh, definitely much smaller size than we would typically see it in alligator. But given that uh, the maximum size of these um, diplocynodon, the fossil one, is about one meter, meter and a half, something like that, then, you know, that's not too surprising, really. But it's great that we can actually, like, address issues of sexual maturity in this fossil, which is um, just, just exceptional. Um, so we've got this really, really 
rare case of, of preservation here. Sorry, my, my screen is just like not loading. So all I'm seeing is a blurry version. I'm, I'm going off of memory here, but I'm pretty sure we can move on to the next one. Um, oh, right. So the, the really important thing, though, to keep in mind as we start to try and figure out what happened here, um, how this fossil came to be and what it can tell us is how it actually was collected. And this is the most important piece that you need to know um, because you might see that really great fossil. It's got the, the skull up uh, lying there in beautiful detail with the eggs lying out next to it. But the way these things were collected back in the 1930s, they were finding uh, the coal workers were finding these great fossil skeletons there. They're like, oh my gosh, we've got to preserve this stuff. This is really, really, really important. But because it's so crumbly and fragmentary, if you were to pick these things up, it would just disintegrate into dust. You would have nothing at all. Um, and they really wanted to preserve these things um, in place as much as possible because you're getting like all the little finger bones next to each other. You want to preserve that association because that has a lot of importance for how you then um, take the next steps for the scientific research. So what they came up with in the 1930s um, was to basically melt paraffin wax. So they would actually manage to get a pot out there, melt up this wax uh, in the field, in the pit, and they would pour this melted wax directly onto the fossil bones. Then that would, of course, um, harden as it dried out and cooled off, um, and you would basically have whatever it was embedded in wax. And that um, may seem like, yeah, uh, maybe not the best way to do it. Um, it actually, it kind of worked. Um, and the fact that these things are actually still, still in the same wax that they were put in in the 1930s, and that wax is still there, it's still together, it hasn't like cracked into pieces, is actually a testament to you know their foresight and ability to come up with a workable solution in the 1930s. Um, so, however, that means that they found this thing, they built like a little wall around it, poured the wax in so the wax wouldn't just go all over the place. Um, then they would cover that with plaster and flip it over and bring that back to the lab and they would work down the rock there in the lab where they could do that nice and carefully without um, kind of jostling anything or moving anything any further. And then they basically leave it in the wax that it was in. So that means when you actually see the final product as it would have been, it actually means the other way was up when they found it. So this of course has very, very big significance for um, how you then interpret that, right? Now, they did prepare through the wax much later to get to the, the bottom side of the skull here because they wanted to see some details that help you figure out exactly which species of Diplocynodon it was. Um, they didn't continue through because they wanted to kind of still keep everything together. And if you take away the wax and you don't really have anything that, that bonds that together anymore, right? Um, so this is more or less kind of how this would have been when it was actually found in the field. So it would have been in this sort of belly up position. Now, one other thing that's really, really, um, one thing that's, that's come up is um, the fact that it's actually curved around its trunk is actually really, really, really weird. So the fact that it's got its head curved around to the side of its body with its tail wrapped around it as well is not normal at all. So when you look at some skeletons, you might have be familiar with, especially from like the Jurassic Park movies, um, where the neck is actually curved back around onto the um, backwards onto the back, um, which is a pistatonic um, kind of this perimortem um, preservation style. So that basically is um, something that's actually exclusive to things that have long necks. So we see that in certain kinds of dinosaurs, we see that in certain kinds of birds, um, and a few other kinds of things that have these long necks where basically through some natural processes that neck can actually um, come back around. Now this actually often comes up in cases where these things are being preserved in water because 
it actually has to do with buoyancy of the body versus buoyancy of the head. So because there's some differences there that actually causes the neck to sort of float for a bit. And then uh, slowly as kind of, um, kind of gases make their way out of the body very slowly and dissolve into the water, um, that neck and head will settle and can settle in this kind of uh, what looks like a contorted position. But this is really exclusive to this kind of um, sort of, as we would say, uh, kind of dorsal ventral, basically meaning that it would go towards the back, not towards the side of the body. Um, and let's go to the next. Um, so that really doesn't um, explain what we're seeing in uh, this fossil crocodilian. Now, um, there actually is evidence that was actually done by the same guy that was mapping out this uh, Leichenfeld, this corpse field in Germany, did a bunch of uh, studies in actually Texas, same German dude, um, and included in that some alligator carcasses that were basically put in a situation where um, it was kind of fenced off so you didn't have to worry about coyotes coming in and dragging things off, but they'd be more or less left to just rot as nature would. Um, and if you give uh, an alligator an opportunity to just sit there and decay, um, it more or less stays in the same position. You get a little bit of disarticulation happening, but if you have this just sitting out on land, you get more or less the same position it was in when it died, where the bones are, really. Um, and the skin kind of more or less holds those in place to a certain extent. Um, so we don't expect any real curvature happening in any direction if you allow this thing to just dry out on land um, and maybe you have little bugs and, and stuff eat away at it. Now, if we're talking in water, that is a bit of a different circumstance there. In water, um, after a few days, you do get um, what's called a, a bloat phase uh, where these things will actually invert. So they'll go belly up. Um, and this was done, uh, they did a couple of cases um, where they basically put um, recently deceased crocodiles. These were naturally deceased. Um, and uh, put them into effectively fish tanks and did different uh, things to them to just kind of see what would happen there. And it takes about four and a half days for that to um, basically kind of cause the inversion and then it would kind of slowly drift down to uh, the bottom of the, you know, whatever body of water that it's in. Um, so in three different scenarios, we're looking at uh, outlines of skeletons uh, from this study. And uh, all the way to the left is where um, these things were put in there, right side up, and they were buried. So they just piled dirt on top of them. So this is a rapid burial scenario. And in that scenario, actually, there's no inversion happens. Everything stays under the dirt and basically stays exactly as it was in life. So there's no change happening there whatsoever. In the middle scenario, they... Um, allowed the belly up phase to happen and then buried it. And in that case, you do get a good bit of, uh, you get some disarticulation, right? So you got some of the limbs are, aren't quite where they were in life. Everything is still pretty much in place. And importantly, that spinal column is still pretty darn straight. If you do nothing, if you just throw that crocodile in there, it goes belly up, it just falls back down. Just don't even bury it at all. Just let it sit there. You get the case all the way on the right there, where things are, are definitely more jumbled up, right? So you don't not getting this nice, beautiful laid out skeleton, but there's still some decent association there, right? You're still seeing a spinal column that's still pretty darn straight there, um, and uh, you're you know you're still getting some kind of association there, even if it's not everything as as you would have expected as it was in life. Um, now, there's one other component here that um, should be kind of considered, and that is flow. So we know that there's a good bit of water around there. Um, was there a current um, that would be influencing kind of the, the orientation of this crocodile? Um, now, because they took such meticulous notes there, you can actually start to, you can actually address this question directly. So what I did is I took the one meter grid there. There are about um, a couple hundred skeletons there, mostly fish. Fish are actually great though because they're basically a compass needle, right? So using that and the other kind of skeletons that were there, I was able to get compass directions based on the notes here of uh, how these things were oriented. 
And from that, you can actually quantify those compass directions into what's called a rose diagram, which is this thing on the right here. Basically what this is, is taking things in, I'm pretty sure it's five degree bins of that compass direction. And had there been a consistent flow, you would expect to see um, really, really strong orientation. So you should see really in one direction, but uh, failing that in, in two directions very, very strongly with really nothing showing up in any other direction if there is a consistent flow. Um, basically, if you run the stats on this, it doesn't add up to anything you would call statistically significant. There is a weak correlation kind of going more or less north-south there, um, just a little bit off, um, but it's it's not even statistically valid. So it, it doesn't seem like there's a strong current um, that would have been influencing this. So it's it's really not accounting for the orientation of the, the crocodile here either. Next. All right. So what did happen? Um, as you probably start to pick up here, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, the short answer is like, you're never really going to know there. But from having gone into all this stuff here and, and try to come up with the most likely scenario to me, and I will admit there are absolutely other ways you can interpret this, but from spending the huge amount of time that I have on this, this is the scenario that I've come up with that kind of jives the best for me looking at what I've been able to learn from this. One thing to keep in mind that I actually haven't brought up here is that egg clutches are usually much larger than the five eggs that were preserved with this uh, diplocyanidon. Normally there are you know, 20 or even more eggs, right? So your scenario sort of needs to also include why there aren't more eggs, right? So I should also point out there was one leg that was actually detached from the body. It was actually um, just a little bit a ways over kind of by the other eggs there. So the scenario I came up with, um, keeping in mind that uh, alligators and caimans make their nests in mounds of vegetation, right? So the mother made this mound of vegetation, you had all the eggs in there, and they typically just kind of sit there, curled around it, protecting it um, until the eggs are ready to hatch. And they'll kind of go off to catch some food, but then they come back. Um, they're, they're never very far away from the nest, right? So it's very normal for these things to be curled around their mound of eggs there, right? Um, so in this scenario, she um, dies more or less in place on the mound and um, is basically allowed to desiccate there. Um, the egg nest is either raided by other animals, so a bunch of the eggs get taken, um, or they basically fall out from the nest and are otherwise disassociated from the rest of them, right? Um, during that desiccation, we do see some of these limbs tend to kind of come away from the body or aren't as clearly attached. At some point, simply following, following gravity, the body flips, just falling off the mound itself as it maybe dries out and is no longer able to support it. That allows for the inversion. The leg that already detached during desiccation is left there. You've got the eggs still in their place. And over time, plants come in, start growing up all throughout that and start dying and building that mat. Water probably gets involved at some point as well, um, allowing for these kinds of things to um, uh, basically build up and get preserved in place. And sorry, I'm trying to like get... It's it's hard to, to watch the, the chat here, but I did see somebody said, could the eggs have hatched? Actually, no, um, because typically you would see a, a very clear um, exit point for the eggs, um, and we're not seeing that. Um, and we're also not seeing really any remains within. Everything is, is pretty compressed within a single plane. Um, and the, the most likely uh, explanation for that is that the... Eggs also died uh, pretty early into their developments that they didn't actually even get to the point where they're they're making solid bones yet um, so that they, they wouldn't really have much of a chance for fossilizing. I will again admit there are other explanations out there. Um, now, in terms of what actually caused the death, um, there are a bunch of reasons that could be out there. You can never really rule out disease. Most diseases don't leave any signs whatsoever in the bone. Um, but crocodilians tend to be pretty hardy. Um, and there's actually uh, an interesting case that happened that, that might give us some 
idea of, of not only why the, the mother crocodile died, but excuse me, why, um, why there's this corpse field or this field of death um, uh, is here. And that might have to do with temperature. So when we look at uh, things like the plants have actually, uh, in other past studies, have given us really good climate data um, in the form of, uh, among other things, the coldest month mean temperature. So what that means is what was the average temperature of the coldest month of the year represented at Geiseltown. We can actually figure that out based on the plant fossil record. Um, and from that, we can actually look at similar environments today that have similar coldest month mean temperatures. And one of them is the Florida Everglades. Now, the Florida Everglades is in very far south Florida, um, where it's really, really, really nice and warm year, uh, pretty much year round, even in the coldest month. And um, in that environment, you get both alligators and crocodiles, as well as a bunch of fish and stuff. And a lot of those things are um, kind of used to uh, warm temperatures, right? So things like the crocodiles really don't show up any further north than that. They're not used to cold month mean temperatures any colder than uh, the Florida Everglades there. And in 2010, there is um, a cold snap, meaning that temperatures got weirdly low, like way lower than they normally do for the coldest month mean temperature. And it caused the death of a lot of crocodiles. It also caused the death of a lot of the more tropical fish. And it was really the only more cold tolerant animals that actually survived through this cold snap there. Um, notably also this study was, uh, another study was done in South Carolina where um, caiman were kept outside. It's not a, a great scenario, but it's something that happened. Um, and a bunch of caiman died because they were not adapted to uh, weirdly cold temperatures. Um, and it's it's at least possible that this is what led to the death of, of mother, of eggs, of um, even uh, the other animals that were around at the time. Um, so it's, it's just kind of more or less a possibility, really, um, looking at um, kinds of scenarios out there. I'll, again, fully admit that there are other ways that might explain this. Um, now, this is actually, this is a painting in the Geiseltal Museum that was done a number of years ago. Uh, it's actually on directly onto the wall here of this Leichenfeld or this corpse field of this kind of death and destruction here. Um, this is a possible scenario. Again, not the only explanation out there, but a possible case for why these things were all gathered in death together here. Um, there's one other explanation, though, for how this uh, mother might have died, which actually has nothing to do with temperature, and that is something called dystocia. Now, this is not a well-known thing, um, but it's basically egg binding. This is where, um, during the process of egg laying, an egg more or less gets stuck in uh, the canal of the mother and um, no other eggs can get out. Um, and this is usually in the process of so sometimes like she'll lay some, but then something will get stuck. Um, and it's really bad. It's really bad. Now this is much, much more common in snakes, lizards, and turtles. Um, and it's actually exceptionally rare in crocodiles. I could actually only find one, one record of this happening in crocodiles. It doesn't mean that hasn't happened other times in the past, even in you know human history, but it's only been actually documented one time that I could find. Um, and it leads to death of the mother every time, unless it's, you know, there's human intervention. Um, it typically takes a few weeks. It's not a quick death by any means. Um, and in that scenario, if, you know, we do have an egg that's preserved somewhere near the, the quote unquote vent or where the egg would have been laid of the mother, if that's the case, that still actually means that she was staying with those eggs that she had laid and did not leave and died with them right there. Um, so even if that's a case of, you know, she died from dystocia and not from cold, that's still showing your parental behavior there, that she stuck with them until her very end, um, which is still, you know, not only incredible in that sense, but if this is in fact dystocia, this is actually, so far as I know, the 
uh, one and only case in the fossil record where that's been shown for any archosaur. For that includes um, birds, dinosaurs, all that other stuff. I could not find a case of dystocia shown in the fossil record for any of these other animals. So this would actually be the first case of that into the fossil record for any archosaur, which is crazy. But again, because there's other scenarios, it's not you know it's not a slam dunk that that it was dystocia, although it's got some 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 things going for it. Um, one last uh, thing that kind of came up during the review process was this idea of post-mortem quote-unquote birth. Um, this comes up a lot for ichthyosaurs, which is what's shown here. It's basically, if you don't know what they are, they're like a reptilian dolphin. They're really weird animals. Anyway, um, a bunch of these have been preserved where uh, a baby is basically preserved in what seems like the act of birth, right? So, you know, birth went uh, pear-shaped and both the mother and the baby died together there. Um, some people had argued that maybe gases building up in the body of the mother would have actually pushed the baby out. So actually it was just a pregnant mother that died um, and not one that was in the act of giving birth and that the gases pushed the baby out. This is actually uh, refuted pretty definitively um, because the gases that are the result of putrefaction in a subaquatic environment um, are are soluble. They basically just go directly into the water. So you wouldn't really be getting that gas buildup. You wouldn't be getting the pressure. Um, there are there is still the possibility of currents explaining why these things would become um, why the the baby would kind of come out a bit, um, as well as gravitational collapse. So like a you know the the weight of you know part of the body of the mother um, might have been enough to push it out. That doesn't seem very likely. Um, and instead, seems like it's more like the the original interpretation that this was um, basically a failed birth process that um, ended very tragically for the both of them. So uh, some takeaways here. Um, this does extend, in my opinion, pretty definitively um, evidence of parental care back 45 million years into the fossil crocodilian record. Um, so that shows that there is at least that much antiquity to parental behavior in crocodilians. It's still not refuting that this isn't something that goes way back to the beginning, um, but it's actually adding to that and supporting that. Um, we can also um, potentially have the first case of dystocia, or we might have some explanation for why everything died there. Um, and uh, shows a definite case for sexual maturity. Um, so a really good indicator in uh, fossil species there, which is very, very rare to be able to do that, uh, as well as a uh, direct association for this OO species, the species of fossil egg, with the um, species of crocodilian that's laid it, which is all super, super remarkable and incredible. Um, all right, so a few thank yous. Uh, I did have a co-author here, Meinolf Helmand, Dr. Meinolf Helmand, uh, who unfortunately did pass away a couple years ago, but he helped out a lot. He was a curator at the Gazeltal Collection. Um, and my uh, fellowship was funded by the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, um, which is the Federal Cultural Foundation of Germany. Um, so that was all super. I had one more slide of just some, some stuff. Maybe that was it. Maybe that. <laughs> In any case, thank you very much to everybody here um, for to staying with me and um, we've got some time here so I will take some questions. Yes, that is the end of it. There are no answers. Okay, great. So thank you very much, very much. Um, and I, oh boy, this chat box is full. So uh, particularly if you got some burning questions, go ahead and put them in the chat now, even if you already asked them because uh, I have not seen them and that's a lot to scroll through in a short amount of time. Um, I should also add, um, as, I, as I'm pretty sure Chantal put in the, the chat box, there is a fireside chat uh, that I'll be doing on Monday at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. my time. Um, so uh, if you don't get a chance to talk about your stuff and you have a chance to, to come in, um, we can certainly chat some more about this stuff then. Um, but we do have some, a few minutes now, so if you got um, some questions that you want to get in there, go ahead and drop them into the chat box and I will take them. And thank you again. Yeah, and Chantal just put the fireside chat in again. Thank you. Uh, okay, how old is the fossil? It is about 45 million years old. So that puts us in the 
Eocene, um, which is uh, not right after the Age of the Dinosaurs. It's actually the one after that. Um, so it's, you know, it's a decent time afterwards, but it's still kind of a, not anywhere near the kind of world that we have today. It was actually much hotter back at the time, which is part of why you get such um, really cool um, reptiles in a place like Europe where, you know, you can't support any crocodilian species in Germany today at all. It's just much too cold. Is the shape of the fossil due to its decay process or an indication of how it died? Um, both, <laughs> really. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, there's a few kind of ways to look at it, but in terms of the curvature, you really can't explain it just on decay alone. There has to be another thing there. And what seems to be cases is kind of how it was when it died in in my opinion, based on on all that I learned from this, was a, a factor in in how it um, came to be preserved in the position that it was in. There's just really no natural decay process that would explain that curvature. Uh, let's see. So the croc exhibit maternal care. That's that's what it seems to be, really. Um, how does this creature differ from modern animals? Smaller, matures more quickly. Any other characteristic? Um, so. There's actually a lot of Diplocynodon that uh, have been found at this site. So this exact species. And they seem to really max out at about like three feet, three feet and a little bit uh, in length or about one meter. Um, so they're not a big species. They're smaller, certainly, than modern alligators. Um, and they might have reached maturity at kind of younger or older ages, but um one thing we can say is that, at least in terms of size, they're definitely doing it at smaller body size. So this adult um, is, you know, was um, just a little bit under sort of the maximum um, body size that we're seeing for the species. So this is still kind of hitting sexual maturity before kind of the, the biggest that it, it could have been expected to get to. Um, uh, so the croc exhibit maternal care. Isn't that rare for a cold-blooded organism? It's actually not rare. Um, actually, all, all modern crocodiles and alligators, all the different species, um, at the very, very least, um, do nest attendance. So they lay their eggs and they stay with them and do not leave and will defend that fiercely from predators and, and anything else that might come into them. Um, and that's pretty much across the board. Um, you also, I mean, you not only see that in birds, which are, of course, warm-blooded, but you actually see that in um, certain species of snakes, um, as well as certain species of lizards that will actually, um, at the very least, kind of watch over the eggs. Um, famously, though, uh, turtles do not do this. They are actually terrible parents. They don't really do anything at all. Uh, they lay a ton of eggs, and then they just peace out, and that's it. Um, so in the case of like sea turtles, they just, you know, dig a hole, bury them, and then that's it. Good luck to you. Um, but it's actually common in a lot of other kinds of reptiles. Yeah, so some fish will actually do parental care as well. That's kind of hit or miss as well. There are definitely fish that don't do any parental care whatsoever. There's some that will even, you know, actively eat their own children. Um, so it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum in terms of fish. Uh, let's see. Oh, baby crocodiles sort of chirp when they hatch. Um, it is, I think, the most adorable sound that exists on Earth is, uh, especially baby alligators that do this little, uh, what's called pipping noise, um, when they're, you know, coming out of their eggs, um, or even kind of when they're still young, they're just trying to get the attention of an adult. Um, this is just a, a call out and being like, hey, hey, hey. Um, and, um, Mothers in particular will respond directly to that noise and come and will fend off. So like, you know, if a predator is coming around, they'll scare that off in response to that noise. And what's interesting is it doesn't even necessarily have to be their own kids. Other adults will sometimes respond to that noise and fend off predators. Um, so it's there's a, a little bit of kind of communal parenting that can happen within crocodilians. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see, is there a correlation between number of offspring and parental care? Um, 
if you're looking across all kinds of things that have kids, typically parental care, um, they exhibit more parental care the fewer children that they have, usually. Um, so in the case of like, if you take like humans, we typically just have one kid at a time and we have, you know, we take care of our kids for years and years and years. Um, so there's a lot more investment in that one species. And when you look at certain kinds of birds that have um, just like one egg or just a couple eggs, they tend to really stick with their kids and really invest a lot of time and energy in that next generation. Whereas if they have larger um, clutches than they do progressive typically do progressively less um, care for them. But something like a chicken doesn't do nearly the level of care that something like an eagle tends to do. But there's exceptions to all of that. Um, so crocodilians do have a lot of, of kids, to, or they have a large clutch anyway. And they tend to stick around for like a year or a couple of years sort of thing. They will go on to have other clutches in that uh, meantime, and they'll have progressively less kind of concern for their kids as they get older. Um, so there's there's sort of kind of a spectrum to that. And of course, there's some exceptions. But generally, generally, if you have fewer kids, you invest more time and energy in in their health and well-being. This is part of why sea turtles have so many eggs, because they don't do anything at all. Um yeah crocs are aquatic so they develop that um let's see okay all right uh so Dave miami says last time i worked in a coal mine we used dynamite rather than paraffin uh that's a very very different kind of procedure there that coal is carboniferous right in like appalachia but could we be using losing valuable tetrapod fossils most of what we get were plants um, I actually, I shudder to think of how many fossils are lost through the mining process. Um, it, I, I guarantee wonderful, amazing, beautiful fossils have been lost all the time throughout um, the, you know, centuries and centuries of mining, um, just because of the nature of the mining process, especially when you start getting into explosives. I guarantee many, many wondrous things have been blasted to smithereens over time. Um, but I try and stay on the folk, on the positive side of that because um, really these mines um, very rarely have any actual like legal obligation to preserve anything whatsoever. Um, so the fact that they often do in these cases and usually just out of you know good faith, you know, a mine worker sees something that looks extraordinary and will will usually go out of their way to preserve that as best they can. Sometimes, you know, there's just, there's no stopping it. Like I talked to a um, guy who, who operated a quarry on the Virginia, North Carolina border where you could get uh, these footprints. Um, and he, he said one time he had this big chopper and he saw the thing coming down the line, going to the chopper where it's going to get smashed to smithereens. He saw these great footprints and he tried to shut, he shut the machine off immediately but there's a lag time between when you shut it off and when it actually stops. And it was too late. He, he did the best he could, but it chopped the thing into tiny little pieces and was completely obliterated. That's a case where like, you know, the guy was really trying, even though he had no obligation to stop it. Um, and, and still, you know, you can't, can't prevent all tragedies from happening. So I, I guarantee, guarantee it's happened many, many times, even in you know with the the best of intentions out there but it's really only because of the mines existing in the first place that we have a lot of these things so if we weren't doing the mining we wouldn't know these things existed so you know it's there, there's pluses and minuses all around uh, let's see mammals and birds crocodiles are from different reptilian lineages that is true um so mammals came from what we refer to as mammal like reptiles so really reptiles came first and then Mammals are a branch off of that. Um, and that split actually happened even before the age of the dinosaurs. Um, so by the age of the dinosaurs, we have our mammal line, we have our, our um, kind of reptile line, including uh, the reptiles we still have alive today and birds and dinosaurs, all that good stuff. Um, goes way, way, way back um, to uh, before even 250 million years ago. 
and how scary it was out there for that very first mammal. <laughs> yeah, uh, the first mammals were not big at all, and there are definitely much larger predators out there. Uh, the reptiles uh, got to be uh, much bigger, much faster, much sooner than the mammals did. Oh, the mammal-like reptiles are fascinating. So the coolest thing that I like to bring up is uh, Dimetrodon, which is that big sail-backed reptile, is actually a mammal-like reptile. So it, it's not a mammal, um, but it's on the mammal line. So that actually means that it is more closely related to us as, as human mammals than it is to dinosaurs. So even though it shows up in the dinosaur toy kit all the time, and often incorrectly gets called a dinosaur. It's actually closer to us than it is to dinosaurs. It's really cool. I think that's amazing. Endotherms do have certain advantages over ectotherms. I'd say uh, being able to colonize cold places is the biggest one. Um, you do see, you know, some like reptiles will make it up into some colder areas, but in terms of like hitting diversity and large body size and really kind of commanding the ecosystem, mammals do cold environments way better than quote unquote cold blooded animals. Um, but in really greenhouse environments, it's not as clear cut in a lot of cases in the past, uh, reptiles actually do better than mammals in warm environments. Uh, let's see. Do dicynodonts are another mammal like reptile? They're super cool. Uh, some of them have these like uh, really um, pronounced tusks, too, which is really cool. The um, one of the, the ways to describe dicynodonts that uh, the Smithsonian did recently was to call them tubby, tusked, and tough, which I like because they are all three of those things. Uh, let's see. Maps like the German 1930s grid could be so packed with data. By digital representation, one could have pop-ups for each item from putting a cursor over the fossil icon. That's absolutely true. We could kind of turn that into a, a sort of GIS exploration there because we have the fossils, we have the, the map data. Um, so you could actually reconstruct that. And it's, again, I will sing the praises of the meticulousness of that team back in the 1930s to record all that data because, you know, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be known unless they had done that. So... Um, major kudos to the thoroughness of 1930s scientists. Some reptiles like varanids have limited ability to control body temperature. Um, yeah, so uh, varanids, which are your monitor lizards, um, live in, in pretty much exclusively hot places. Um, so they're in places where um, the temperature swings very rarely get outside of kind of their normal comfort zone, though. Um, they do live in both uh, wet and dry places. They can handle some some variability in terms of how um, wet the environment is, but temperature a little less so. But I think that's one of the reasons why you don't tend to see varanids in, in cooler climates, whereas you do see things like turtles and uh, certain kinds of snakes can get into these cooler climates. All right. Um, so we are kind of at time here, um, and I am going to have to log off here in a little bit, um, but I'll just remind you guys again one more time. If you want to uh, come in for the fireside chat on Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific, I'll be logged in for an hour then, and that is just for chatting about whatever. So happy to talk about any of this stuff. Anything else you might want to talk about in general, I am happy to talk about whatever. Um, and that will be here at Science Circle. Um, so just log in, come back here. Um, I'll be here. And um, if you want to continue the conversation then. And I will say thank you all again for listening and attending here today. I hope you liked it. And have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks. Thank you.